Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm excited about 2020. Amen? Well, let me ask you a question. Are you excited about 2020 or are you excited that 2019 is over? Which, which is it for you? 2020? Good things ahead, bad things behind. Either way, I don't care. I'm, I'm, I'm ready for the new. How about you? I'm ready for the new. <clears throat> Uh, on the on the week be- between uh, Christmas and New Year, kind of like the new trend in uh, churches today is a closed service because nobody goes to church. And so we decide to have one service and everybody comes. So hallelujah. And uh, what we like to do uh, before the New Year is we like to give a kind of a kind of a teaching on um, how to make the most out of the new year. That's kind of what we like to do. And uh, so we often, uh, as opposed to preaching, I do teaching, and I want to uh, kind of teach you this year how to make big decisions, how to discern the Lord's will in big decisions. Uh, and hopefully this will kind of help out in the new year and uh, kind of help you uh, quit being tossed to and fro, not knowing what God wants. Can you say amen? <clears throat> we... um. We read the New Testament, and uh, uh, sometimes we get a distorted view of what it looks like to live with God. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. I would like to live a lifestyle of 24-7 hearing God audibly. Wouldn't you? Amen? I, wanna, I, wanna, I want miracle signs and wonders to happen wherever I go. I, I would like prison walls to be broken. I would like uh, you know, bondage to be loose. I would like the name of Jesus to made, be made famous everywhere I go. Uh, but how many of you know that's not what the Bible even says that happened to the apostles? That's not even what happened. Watch this to Jesus, right? Like he went and prayed in solitude. He had times of trouble. He had times uh, where the, the path was not all together clear, and he had to discern the Father's will. But we can kind of skip from highlight to highlight in the Bible and kind of miss that there's a process often of discerning the Lord's will. And uh, if you don't have my handout this morning, uh, I believe the ushers have one, and they'd love to give you one. Uh, if you raise your hand, they will begin to give them out while I'm talking. And, uh, and do you have them? Yes, they're doing it now. And just kind of flag one down. Uh, I'm not gonna, you're not going to need it for a minute, so don't panic yet, all right? Many times in the New Testament, we see the apostles getting divine guidance on what they're supposed to do. And I particularly like that. <clears throat> I like not having to think as much and God doing all the thinking for me. How about you? I like him making decisions for me. Um, and we see particularly in the book of Acts uh, and throughout his writings, Paul um, often got really supernatural divine guidance in ways that was unmistakable. We see he got, there were dreams and and visions, there were prophecies, and there was an internal sense of the Holy Spirit's leading that we see throughout Scripture. And and this often led to major components of the apostles' mission. We see Holy Spirit speaking about changes in direction. We see encouragement in tough circumstances. And, And you know many of these. We see in Acts chapter 8, an angel showed up. The angel showed up to Philip and said, get up, go to the south to the road that leads from Jerusalem to Gaza. It's made it very, very clear what God wanted Philip to do in that moment. I, how many of you know when an angel shows up and tells you to go, it's pretty clear on what God wants you to do. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. Makes it pretty clear. I, uh, if you know anything about me, um, I believe in angels. <laughs> I believe in demons. I believe there's more angels than demons. I believe if you're a child of God, you're more likely to hear an angel than a demon. Now, if you're not a child of God, well, I wouldn't trust every voice you hear. <clears throat> if you've not given your life to Jesus, 2020 is a good year to quit being dumb and follow the God of your creation. Amen. 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 <clears throat> I get this... Uh, we got a little extra time today. See, I normally preach for 40 minutes twice, and you generally get half the revelation in each service. So you get it all this time. So um, it may take a little longer. But if you're done before I am, we don't lock the door. What would happen if we actually trusted that God spoke to us through angels? 
Now, we're not glorifying angels, and I'm not praying to angels, and I'm not praying for angels. You'd be kind of dumb to do that anyways, right? Like, I hear people saying that all the time, but we don't pray to angels, do we? I'm like, who does that? Like, where did that come from? Where did that lie come from? The enemy, possibly. I'm not, have you ever met, um, okay. <laughs> okay, I want to I kind of uncover some things here. Can we do that just for a second? It has nothing to do with my message. Has anybody in here ever seen or heard from an angel? Wait, wave your hand if you would, please. Look at that. It's not that uncommon. Has anybody ever heard an angel to tell them to worship the angel? No. Never once. It's not going to happen. It's not a fear. Don't be fearful of that. And here's what you do. If they say to worship them, you know what you say, Lillian? No. Right? So let's just lift that fear off, right? You say no. And then you say, shut up, devil, right? Are you with me? It's not that complicated, right? But God talks to us. Like, that's part of being a child of God. If you have a child and you don't talk to them, you know what they call that? Bad parenting. It's bad parenting. And, 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 and I, I heard the song, he's a good father. Not only that, he's a good, good father. It's who he is. <laughs> so we can trust that he talks to us. We can trust that he talks to us. We can trust that. And God wants to be a part of your decisions, but God is not looking for robots. Right? Now, we see in very major areas, the Lord audibly or, 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 or in an overwhelming sense directed the apostles in the Bible. After, after he told Philip to go up to the road, he speaks to him again in, uh, in, in Acts uh, 8, 29. He says, the spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. Now, this is interesting. He says, the Spirit told him. That means that Philip knew the voice of Holy Spirit. Enough that when he told this story, he told people, the Spirit told me to do this. And when they recorded it, they recorded it as such. Not God, God. God said. If you're in ministry yet, you get get ready for people to come tell you. Well, God said, I'm supposed to do this. What do you think I should do? Well, I'm going with God. I I I don't know what to tell you. I don't... What am I supposed to say when you tell me God said? Well, if God said it, I don't know. The question is, did he he say? Did he really say? And if he did, why are you talking to me? Why aren't you doing it? Maybe he didn't say. Let's just say things like, I think God might have said. I feel like God may have said to me, can you pray with me to see if this is really the Lord's will, if I discerned this properly? Right? This is like, this is how we grow in God. This is how we invite people into the conversation so we can hear him more clearly. Amen. Amen. Goodness gracious, I'm pulled in 50 directions this morning. I'm going to get into this teaching. <clears throat> All right. Um, we don't prescribe a version of the Bible at Revival Life Church. I use the New American Standard Bible. If you're anointed, you'll do the same. But, <laughs> but there's, there's lots of good translations of the Bible. And part of what makes a good translation of the Bible is a qualified team that does the translation. There, there's no good translation of the Bible that's translated by one person. Because one person cannot hear God perfectly. It takes a team. These are people with very advanced degrees who have spent their entire life figuring out what these Greek and Hebrew words mean. And it's a good and then, then there's some new kind of popular translations that are out. Uh, that many charismatic people are using that one person wrote. And it's deeply flawed. I don't mind people reading it. I think it's, you know, it's good for devotion, but it's not a translation of the Bible. There's just too many flaws. And so there's a lot of anointed people who are hearing God and preaching a lot of stuff, but you're like, "Mm, I'm not sure God said all of that. I think some of that needs to be tested, right? Because we don't want to say God said when he didn't say. We don't want to put things in God's mouth that he didn't ever actually say. I really dislike it when I am misrepresented, when someone says, I said something I didn't say. I really dislike that. God dislikes it even more. Bad theology is dangerous. Bad theology hurts people. Bad theology leads people away from God. We need good theology, and good theology is done in community. Good theology is done in community. Good theology is not done in isolation. And we personally need to have good theology in community, for our own lives. Amen. So we hear, like, Saul was traveling down the Damascus road, and he audibly heard the voice of God, and he was blinded, 
and he fell off his horse. That's a pretty clear sign that God is trying to tell him something, right? But then God had Saul go into community to hear God more clearly. This is a guy who had a personal visitation to Jesus. Needed community to rightly discern what the Father had for him to do. It had Ananias, had a vision that instructed him to go visit Saul. If you remember this? Cornelius is instructed by an angel in a vision to send for Peter. Peter's instructed by the Spirit to visit Cornelius. Peter is ordered by an angel to follow him out of prison. In Acts chapter 13, we see again when uh, it's time for people to be brought into ministry. It says, while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said. Holy Spirit speaks today. We need to be filled with the Spirit in 2020 so we can fully hear what God is speaking to us. Amen? Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. And I love this. I love this super, super clear voice. I love when God speaks and there's no doubt what He is speaking. But I have found that is kind of the exception, not the rule. I have found that God doesn't always speak this way. We see that Paul wanted to go and minister in Asia in Acts chapter 16, and he says the Holy Spirit prevented him from doing that. Now, the Bible doesn't say if the Holy Spirit prevented him with an inner witness, if maybe the winds made it as such that he couldn't sail there, and he attributed that to Holy Spirit, or possibly he couldn't get a boat to go, or possibly there's got a hundred different ways that he discerned that Holy Spirit told him not to go, but it's not in Scripture how the Holy Spirit prevented him, so we're left to be open to God speaking to us so many different ways. Amen. What we need is we need to develop a way in our lives to hear God supernaturally and through Scripture to make big decisions. Let me say it again. We need to develop a way to hear God supernaturally and through Scripture to make big decisions decisions. And here's why that's super important. When God has you do something very big, there's going to be great opposition. And you need to know in the opposition that God is with you. You need to know that you made this decision with God because once you're in the battle, it's easy to forget why you're even fighting this fight. And then we give up and then we get discouraged. And then we wonder, did I miss God at all? Or am I in his will? Amen. The enemy is winning more people from God through discouragement than sin. And we need resolution that I've heard God. This is a decision we've made. And this is where we need to go. So, so many people, they, um, <clears throat> we're waiting for God to give us instruction. And, and we need to remember that our lives are a story that we're writing together with God. It's a story we're writing together with God. Your hopes and dreams matter. Your personality matters. What you want to go do matters. What you want your life to become matters. Who God is matters. What God wants matters. God is looking for co-laborers, and you're writing this life story with God, and He's writing it with you. And so as we look at our lives through this lens of it's a story that God is telling together with us, all of a sudden, it's not when I get in a pickle, I need God to bail me out. Instead, it's, hey, God, we're walking through this thing together. Let's figure this out together. Does that make sense? <clears throat> most of us live our lives kind of on autopilot. And when I say most of us, I talk about all of us, people. People tend to live their lives on autopilot. And so when we tell somebody about Jesus, or we tell them they should come to church, for some people, that may be the first time in their lives that they actually live their life on purpose, and it's weird to them. It's very strange to people who live their lives on autopilot to do things purposefully with vision. We wonder, why don't you come to church with me? Why? I've invited you so many times. You see, my life changed. I don't understand why you're not coming. And the simple reason is that most people don't have an actual vision for life change. They have somewhere they want to wind up, but they have no plan to get there. And somehow we think, if I just live my life the way I've always lived it, I'll just wind up where I'm supposed to be. Somehow I'll just one day wake up and I'll be in the promised land. And, and you and I both know it just doesn't work out that way. It just doesn't work out that way. And so we have to redefine what God says to justify where we've reached. Instead of saying, 
This is the story that I'm writing with God, and this is the chapter I'm in right now, and I'm not in the grand finale. I'm not in the, in the arc of the story yet. I'm, I'm right here where I'm supposed to be, but I'm living my life on purpose. No, I can't go with you there because I, there's a story that's being written in my life, and that is not part of it. Now, I say, no, I, I can't go with you to that place, and I can't go with you into those, and I don't want to listen to that with you because there's a story that I'm writing in my life with God, and I don't want that part of the story. But we have these competing forces in our lives. We, we have what's, what's considered our, our impulsive side. That's the side that we just do automatically. It's our habits and all that. And it competes with our intentional side. And I have it up here, and I'm going to talk about these two just for a moment before I actually get into the teaching. So bear with me, if you would, so you know what I'm talking about. This impulsive side is, is what you just kind of kind of who you are without thinking about it. It's, it's your desires, your instincts, your skill, your habits. It's these thoughts that pop into your mind without thinking. That's your impulsive side. That's, and the majority of the population of the planet lives this way. And so we sometimes, especially when you have small children, you want to ask them, hey, when you did that, help me, what were you thinking? Help me, help me understand what were you thinking? And the truth is, they weren't. They weren't. As a parent, we're not thinking the impulsive side. We're thinking the intentional side. We're believing that our kids were doing things on purpose when really all they're doing is living out of just impulse. They live out of impulse. And good parenting helps push our children a little from the impulsive to the intentional. Now, nobody's supposed to fully live in the intentional. But we want to be intentional enough that it affects our impulses. Does that make sense? See, intentional, that's, that's where our beliefs are, our ethics, our values, our logic. This is how we think when we take a second and weigh the options. This is the intentional. Now, often the intentional will defy our impulse. Let me say it again. The intentional thoughts defy our impulsive thoughts. Let me, let me give you a spiritual example. It's when you're in worship and you raise your hands and you say, I give it all to you, God, knowing that you'll make something beautiful out of me. And the Lord says, absolutely, in 2020, I want you to start tithing. And you're like, yes, I will do it. And then Monday, you're like, yeah, I don't know about that. I got the rent coming. You go from intentional, where God has an intentional plan for our lives, back to the impulsive. And in the spiritual sense, we need to get around the anointing enough so it can seep into us and start to affect our impulses. Because our impulses want to fight against the intentionality of life. It's our nature to fight anything that comes against what we already think is true. Let me say that again. It's our nature to fight against anything that we already believe to be true. Once we've accepted something as truth, it is hard. And the older we get, the harder it is to accept that something that we've accepted as true is not true. This is why you don't want to bring up politics at the Thanksgiving dinner, amen? Okay, hallelujah. Let me give you this, an example of this in the natural. In 1504, Copernicus discovered that the sun was the center of the solar system, right? And he quietly kept it a secret because the political and religious powers had come together and decided that the earth was the center of the universe. All known creation revolved around the earth. And to say that the church might be wrong about something like this is to say that God possibly is not true. How many know that God is not threatened by science? Science is just discovering God's creation. That's all. They're about a billion years behind, right? But they're on the journey. So he quietly wrote about this theory. And it was just a theory at that time. He wrote about this theory for about 25 years before he published the book in 1541. I have a scan of it right here. And I would tell you the, 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 the title of this, but it's Latin, and I don't speak Latin. But in English, it's on the revolutions of heavenly spheres. And you see the, the sun is at the center, and the earth is the third celestial body. And uh, this, this actually, I, 
I'm not sure where you're at in your science journey, but this is actually true, right? Like the sun is at the center, and the planets are revolving around the sun, right? In the 1500s, this was radical new truth that nobody believed because it went against their impulses. I mean, clearly the sun revolves around the earth. I watch it rise every day, and I watch it go down. Clearly, we're at the center. Clearly, we're at the center. I'm watching it revolve around me, and this is how our lives are. Everything, every truth is relative to what we believe is happening in our life. You, you see this. Everything is relative to what we believe to be true. And so among the people that believed Copernicus was a man named Galileo Galilei, right? And he believed him. And so he started telling people about this, and the church put him on trial for heresy. And they found him to be a heretic because he believed this. The church leaders refused to believe that they might actually be wrong. Here, here, here's what I want you to know today. The truth is there, even if all the leaders believe the opposite. The sun has never orbited the earth, and the truth stands on its own. You say amen. amen. The truth stands on its own. And if everybody disagrees about the truth, that doesn't make it the truth. It's still the truth. And so many of us have this conflict between what we want to do and what we should do. What we know to be the truth and how our story is playing out in the midst of this revealed truth. Let me give you a, a real simple example here. We want to lose weight, but we don't want to get off the couch, right? Like this is... I want to weigh less, but I don't want to eat less, right? And how many of you know, if we just believe that eating more causes us to lose weight, we will not get to where we want to be, no matter how hard we confess it. We have a conflict between experience and belief. And we have to embrace what we have learned. <clears throat> Hear me. We have to embrace what we've learned, and we have to force our beliefs to shape our experiences. We have to take a step back, and we have to look at our story. Now, <clears throat> get some piece of paper. Get your pen out or get your note-taking app. <clears throat> I want to <clears throat> teach this and I want to help out. I want to help you kind of craft your story on purpose this year. Amen. <clears throat> Many times when I am in um, a counseling with someone and I talk to people and people say to me, hey, pastor, hey, I just want to know, um, what do you think I should do about this job offer? Or I like this girl. I don't, what do you think I should do? Or what do you think I should do about this family conflict, and they expect there to be some revelatory answer that comes down from heaven without knowing what it is they're talking about. Like I'm some sort of walking oracle, or your life group leader is some sort of Jeremiah on earth. When you need an answer, the Spirit of the Lord descends upon them and speaks out an answer. And let me tell you, anybody who gives you advice without knowing what's going on in your life, don't listen to the advice because they don't know. This is as dumb as asking relationship advice on the internet. The internet's answer is always ghost them, right? That is always the answer on any forum. Like, I had a conflict with my spouse. The dog peed and she didn't clean it up and I don't know what to do. Divorce her and ghost her. Like, that is always the answer. Like, cut off completely. I'm like, what is wrong with you people? This is why you're on the internet all the time. You don't have real people in your life. You've ghosted them all, right? Like, I just... I feel like if that is your answer ever, you should be ghosted by the admins of the site. Just at that moment, no one can ever see your comments ever again. That's it. Like, how's that working out for you? Not so good, huh? Shut up with that advice. <clears throat> so when you have a big decision you're trying to make with God, or you're trying to help somebody with a big decision, or you're trying to come to a conclusion, this is a step we just miss so very often. We have to, watch this, read the backstory. These are the questions we have to ask and we have to figure out for ourselves. Things like, write this down, how did I get here? How did I get here? How did I get to this place of needing to make this decision? Why is this conflict happening? How did I get here and why is this happening? If you figure that out, 
you got 80% of the answer right there. How did I get here? <clears throat> Since we're a church and we love people, we get people who call up and say, hey, um, I'm being evicted from my house today. Can you help? I'm like, well, I don't know. Where do you live? Do we know you? How did you get to the situation of being evicted from your house? Where, where do you live now? Would you, like, what, how do you, no, 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 I just need money. Like, and then they, then they call Pastor Brandon and tell him that he's, he's he, <clears throat> there's an inside joke with our staff. When people want money, they ask for Pastor Brandon, who answers the phone, who's not actually a pastor. But they figure if they give him a title, he'll give them money. <laughs> Hasn't worked yet. <clears throat> but so we start asking them questions like, why are you being evicted? And they, they don't want to talk about this. They just want money. They just want a solution. And we're trying to fix the problem. They think the problem is homelessness. The problem is that you can't keep your house. Yeah. How did we get to this place? What is the backstory? You need to clearly... Now, this is going to take some intentionality on our parts to to discern the Lord's will in big decisions, right? Are you with me? Are you tracking with me here? All right. We have to read the backstory. How did I get here? Why is this happening? Number three, what are my values in this situation? What are my values in this situation? Someone says, hey, I got this, you know, I'm, 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 I'm losing my apartment, and, uh, and I'm not sure what I should do, and I have my boyfriend, and I'm, you know, not sure what to do about that. I think we have a future together, but I'm not sure. You start saying, what are my values in this situation? Well, one of my values is I don't live with somebody I'm not married to. I don't shack up for money. There's a word for that, and we're not going to be that. Amen. We don't shack up for money. It's not what we do, right? Why? Because that is a long-term solution to a short-term problem. This is not what we want for our lives. We're more valuable than that. Amen. We're not practicing divorce here. We are moving in with somebody after we get married to somebody who's given us a lifelong commitment. So my value is I don't live with someone of the opposite sex I'm not married to, right? So what are your values in this situation? And you have to know your values. These are the questions you have to answer. And the last thing in reading the backstory as you're talking about how I got to this place of needing to make a decision, what question am I actually trying to answer? If you were in any place of ministry, you've had many people ask you advice and you want to, at the end, say, here, here, here's what I'm going to give you some magic words to speak when people want advice to you. They'll tell you the, all the problems. They'll tell you everything that's going wrong. And here's the question you need to ask. Are you ready? Are you ready? Here's what you ask. How can I help? How can I help? Because in this world, I tell you my problems and you automatically start giving me solutions. Well, if you, you, you have to recognize that you have a problem first. And if you don't think it's a problem, I don't have a solution. Come on. How can I help? Well, I want to know if you can help me move into my boyfriend's house. E, probably not. No, that's not, not able to do that so much. I want to know if you can pay my rent. Mm, not able to do that either. I have a rent that I'm already paying. It's called my mortgage. That's all I can afford right now, right? Like, are you hearing me? Are we, are we on the same page here? What is the question you actually want answered? What are you trying to accomplish in this? What, what is it that you're trying to come up the solution for, right? So we read the backstory. We say, this is how I got here. This is how I got to the place of not having a car, or this is how I got to the place of having a job offer and another job that I already have, and I'm, I'm seeking God. What is it I'm trying to get answered? Is, am I trying to say, am I supposed to quit my job? Am I supposed to go for a new job? Am I supposed to get a, a career training? Am I supposed to marry this person? Am I supposed to break? Am I supposed to stay a Christ follower? Bam, yes, right? Sometimes when we, <laughs> sometimes when we articulate the question, the answer becomes very obvious. Should I accept this position that has me away from my, my family five days a week? Hmm, wait a minute. Is that really what I'm asking? What happened to my walk, right? Like, like, here's a job offer that I just got after I started following God, and they want me to work on Sunday. Should I take it? No, right? Like, this is what happens. I just got saved, and there's a cute guy now who wants to talk to me. He's not saved, but I'll probably get him saved by dating him. No. Never works. <laughs> Never works. Here's what you say to that. Shut up, devil. Can we go on a date? Yes, Sunday morning, 11 o'clock, 4770 Northwest 2nd Avenue. Let's do it. Me and you, let's do it. Come on. Come on. Come on. Me and you. I'll see you at the altar. 
Hallelujah. Amen. Listen, if that's God's one for you, that, that, that wouldn't be a problem, right? What are my values in this situation? I'm only going to marry somebody who's saved. Who actually honors the fact that I want to worship God, right? Like these are, okay. So what we need to do is we have a big decision we need to make. First, we need to read the backstory. How did I get here, right? This is your story of how you got to this position. The next thing, next slide, next thing you got to find out is you have to find God's story. What has God been speaking all along till we got here? You might say, I have no idea. That's why I'm here to ask you advice. This is the whole problem, Pastor. I'm not sure why we're not starting with this one right here, right? We got to find God's story, and it's not as hard as you think it is. It's not as hard as you think it is. And so here's, here's how I want you to do this, and here's how we can methodically do it. And again, you're going to have to take out some paper and a pen, and this is going to take a little bit of time, right? You've got to find God's story. Here's the first thing you want to do when you're finding God's story. You're going to have to crack open your Bible, all right? Crack open your Bible and read it, right? Read your Bible and just start just devoting yourself to reading Scripture. And pay attention to Scriptures that pop out to you. Holy Spirit will begin speaking verses to you about your situation. Now, don't take the first one and run with it. Write it down, right? Maybe do a word search in the Bible, in a Bible program or on a website, and write down all the scriptures that pertain to this situation. Uh, last year, we were trying to decide what to do with the burning room, and we went through <clears throat> this, ex this exact process. <clears throat> Excuse me. You want to write down every scripture that pertains to the situation you're thinking about. If you're thinking about marriage, you would write down all the scriptures about marriage in the New Testament. If you're thinking about jobs or work or family, find all the scriptures you can find about travel. Write them all down and begin praying through them. You may have several pages worth of them and just begin to pray through these scriptures. In your, in your prayer time, make it quiet, pray through the scriptures, and then you start figuring out which ones pertain to what you're doing and which ones don't. You start eliminating scriptures that aren't really pertaining to what you're doing. They don't really speak to your situation for some reason. You don't feel the juice on them, so to speak. You don't feel the Holy Ghost on these scriptures. And you start to whittle it down till you have a handful of scriptures that you really feel like these are the verses that I'm supposed to be praying over this situation. And then quiet yourself and listen for the Lord to speak. Maybe journal through this season and start writing down what you're hearing the Lord speak about. And again, don't run with the first thing he speaks. I absolutely believe one of my values in this, in pastoral care and in counseling and in ministry is that God will speak to people who want to hear him. <clears throat> I also believe that you have to give him time to do that, though. If you're in confusion, don't expect him to speak the moment you want him to start talking because there's already confusion in the air clouding the communication. Don't be discouraged because you're not hearing him really clearly. It's possible he just wants you to bring more people into the conversation. Amen. Amen. I absolutely believe God speaks and he directs if you will give him the situation and allow his will to be done. Now, in writing how you got here and then discovering what God's story is, you have to at some point say, God, I actually want completely your story to overlap my story. So I want to give up my will for your will, give up my control for your control. So as I'm discerning what you have been doing all this time, I want to give you permission to help me direct this story forward. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so, so you have the situation. You know what you're trying to find out. You know what you're trying to, the, the, the question you're trying to answer. You have written and you figured out how you got here. You're writing down scriptures and you're hearing God and you're journaling and you have it all together. And the next thing I, I, I would suggest you do is at that point, once you have kind of a, you've heard God some things, you have a handful of scriptures, you have what you've been hearing him in prayer, I would invite some trusted counselors into the conversation to seek, to help you seek wisdom and confirmation. This is what I would do at this point. What I would do is, and what I have done is, I then bring someone I trust into the conversation. This is where you seek pastoral care. This is where you seek counseling. This is where you ask for other people to give input, where you can say to them, hey, this is what my problem is. I am here at this point in time, and I'm not sure what to do about my career. And then you say, this is where I have been working. 
This is what I thought I was going to accomplish. I went to school for this. I thought I was going to go there. I've been doing this. This is how I've been working. This is how I got to this situation of not knowing about what I should do with my life. I have been praying about it. I've read the scriptures. I have been hearing God. I've written things down. These are the scriptures that I really feel like God has been speaking to me. This is the dream I had. This is the prophetic word that I had. And I've been looking for signs and wonders. And I I have been waiting for God to speak. I've waited on the Holy Spirit. And this is what he has revealed to me. What do you think about this? Oh, well, now I have something to work with. Amen. Amen. As you're waiting for God to speak in this situation, you can expect God to give you prophetic confirmation on his desire and his will. You can expect that as you are hearing him and you're writing scriptures down, you're going to get signs in the heavens and signs and people are going to walk up to you and just begin saying things. And you're going to be like, why did you just say that to me? And they'll be like, I don't know why I started saying that to you. You're like, I do. It's the Holy Ghost of God confirming what he's been speaking to my heart. Amen. Amen. You got to be looking for Jesus while you're making these confirm- while you're making these decisions. Invite Jesus into the discussion. Like begin looking. You have to seek wisdom. Amen. As you're seeking wisdom, God will speak into your situation. Right? Are, are, are you with me here? I hope this is helpful. All right. So you well, you got to find God's story. You bring someone in as you seek wisdom and confirmation on what you believe God is speaking to you. After you get this clarity, you may have to do this section a couple times. You get wisdom, you get confirmation, you may get people to say, man, that's, wow, this is, this is really good. I love what you guys, I mean, it's not biblical what you've come up with, and let me explain why. And you're like, oh, I think God is saying this. Well, that sounds good, but remember you've done that four times already, and it's failed. Remember, like, let's break this cycle now. Oh, good point. I didn't notice that pattern in my life. And so we go back, and we kind of we sift through it, and we kind of see what's good and what's not, and we see what's God and what's not, and we might actually find the, the error in the cycles of our thinking so we can break out of patterns. Amen. Amen. And so as we do this, then we come upon some real wise counsel and we have some clarity from God. This is how I got here. This is what God's been doing. Next step. Are you ready? We write a new story. Now we write a new story. After we've done all these other steps of research and prayer and bringing counsel in and we've heard from God and, you know, you know you've been thinking this thing and then we sang the song on Sunday and, and Corey said this and you're like, that was God speaking to me. I mean, I, I, what's neat is I, I, I pray publicly, I minister, and then I hear the Lord speaking through me to me, and which is really kind of freaky because I just want to write it down. I want to sit down and be like, I'm sorry, give me 10 minutes. I'll be back in a moment. Go have some coffee. I need to process what God just said to me. I don't have that opportunity so much, but, but this is like, as you're in the anointing, God speaks, amen? amen? When we get all that, we want to start writing our new story, and here's how you do that. You want to write this down, or you can watch the video later. First thing you want to do is, once you come to this point, list all your options. List all the options, even the dumb ones. List the dumb ones. You could say, well... Not sure what to do about my apartment. Be homeless could be an option, right? And so I like scratching those kind off, right? Like I list all the options and then start reducing them, right? So, you know, oh, I'm having conflict with my child. What could I do about that? What, how did I get here? How did we get to this child? What's one option? Well, I could abandon them, you know, and go to jail. All right, let's just scratch, like, let's scratch that one off. Why do I say to do that? It's important to understand when you're in the battle to know that you chose to be there. I chose to be in this battle. This isn't being forced on me. Like, I, 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 I'm, I have a great relationship with my kids, so I'm not uncovering anything right here. I'm just giving this as an example. Uh, when you're having trouble with your children and you're like, oh, what was me? No, no, no. I chose to be here with my kids and raise them. I have chosen to be a parent. I've chosen not to abandon them. I refuse to listen to the lie that I'm stuck here in this situation. I'm here on purpose because I made a decision. When you're having marital issues and you're like, oh, what was me? My marriage said, no, no, I have chosen not to get divorced. I have chosen to stay truthful to my covenant. I have chosen to stay faithful to my God. I have chosen to be here. Things get hard in church and you get disappointed. No, 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 no. I'm not stuck here. I've chosen to walk out where God has placed me to be fruitful and multiply. This is where I've chosen to stand and see the deliverance of God. I've chosen to stand in truth. It's the opposite of the ghost them generation. I am standing and staying engaged and I'm going to see the victory in this thing. I'm going to watch God's story unfold. Are you hearing me? This is a good word right here. This is for me. This is for somebody, including me. So you list all the options, 
And then you start reducing the options. What you're going to come down to is just a couple decent options. Some are good, some are God. Right? You should have no bad options at this point. You should have good options and the God option. Reduce the options, evaluate the remaining ones, and then, watch this, make a decision. List your options, reduce the options, make a good choice about your remaining options, and make a decision. Once you make a decision, it's not you just throwing darts at a dartboard. Like, this is where God is pointing. I've, in reality, looked at everything involved in this decision. I'm not hiding from any of the hard parts. I'm not making a decision avoiding the difficult parts. I've looked at it all. This is what I've decided to do. And then you need to develop a plan. Develop a plan to enact the decision. Develop a plan to enact the decision. And what's that look like? Last thing, tell the new story. You have to tell the new story. What does that mean? Tell the new story. You need to, where the old story was happening, you need to put the new story in place. God is working within my story. This is how my story has unfolded up till here. This is where it will go in the future on purpose. Amen. Amen. On purpose. I'm not sleepwalking through life anymore. This is where it's going on purpose. And you need to think, think things like, who needs to hear this? How do I act to make this new story a reality? Maybe you have had a string of bad relationships and you're like, how do I, how do I? Well, maybe in the future you need to tell your new direction to people who approached you the way the old people approached you. You, you, you hear what I'm saying? That's a good word right there. You need to, you need to like, like, you need to tell people, like, if you have a pattern of allowing people to take you places you don't want to go, emotionally or physically, and they approach you and you don't know, how do I, I don't know how to, I don't know how to break this cycle in my life. You start telling them, hey, oh no, I, I can't really do that. Oh, why not? Well, actually, because I've made a decision in my life that I'm going to break these patterns and I've recognized that I listened to people before take me down roads I didn't want to go. And so I have decided in the future that I'm not actually going to do that. I'm going to follow the plan that God gave me and that's where I'm going to get up where, where God had for me because I'm going to do it on purpose. Right? You need to tell this story to people. Oh, why are you going to church every Sunday? Oh, let me tell you why. Because when I was born, I was born into sin, and I didn't, wasn't a God follower. And then I met Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ changed me, and I decided, hmm, am I going to become a God follower, or am I going to return to my sin? And I decided that I'm going to be a God follower, and I'm going to have the plan of God unfold in my life. So I, every Sunday, I'm in church, in the anointing, so I can hear what God is speaking, so I can live my life on purpose, not just wandering from day to day, wandering from relationship to relation. Actually, this is where I'm going with my life. Amen. 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 We're going to live on purpose. We're going to tell people about it. Amen. 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 We've got to tell the new story. That's right. Don't be embarrassed. See, the Bible just calls that your testimony. That's right. But the testimony isn't just what happened in the past. The testimony is what's happening in the future as well. Amen. Because your testimony is when you receive Jesus Christ, your future is decided. We don't just tell people about how our past was changed. We tell them about how our future has been decided now. You hear what I'm telling you? So now my future is decided because Jesus Christ has come in and uh, he lives and he reigns in heaven. That means that my future will wind up in heaven. This is where I am going. And anything that doesn't point to heaven, that really isn't part of my story. Amen. That's a good word right there. Got a little preaching there for a second. I, amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now you got to do something. Last thing, you got to do something. Do something to make your story a reality. Corey's writing a song right now about it. You have to do something to make your story a reality. Do something. Say it with me. Do something. Even if it's wrong, do something. Don't be so terrified about making the wrong decision you do nothing. Come on up, Mike. And once you do something and you have this plan and you're living life, you have to keep checking it, making sure you're going on the path that God told you to go down. Listen, you were not a surprise to God. Your mom did not get pregnant and God was caught off guard. Right? He wasn't like, oh, my goodness, what am I going to do about that one? Oh, no, not sure I got enough for that one there. Oh, Jesus, come help me. I don't know what I'm going to do now. Little baby Corey's coming. Oh, no, what am I going to do now? That may be how we react. That's not how God reacts. That's not how God reacts. He's not surprised. He wasn't caught off guard. He's not nervous. He actually has a plan. Amen. 
He has a plan, and he's so awesome, he invites us into writing that story. How big and secure is our God that he allows us to come and help him write the story he's already got figured out? Isn't he good? Now, in 2020, um, personally, like, you can do whatever you want, right? Like, I don't want to decide anybody's life. I don't want to live anybody's life for them. I want to allow you to discover God and co-write the story with him that he has for your life. Like, that, is, that is our heart of all the leaders of this house. We don't want to run anybody's life. I don't want to write your story to be my story. I don't want you to have to live my story for your life. That's a source of frustration. And I don't want you to write anybody else's story for them either. I want God to be the author of your story, and I want you to watch it unfold in your life. Watch this on purpose. On purpose. I want it to be this time next year, and I want to see that like plans have unfolded, and you've come into things, you've made changes, so you're not living out of instinct, out of impulse but you're living purposefully in 2020. You're living intentionally in 2020 to fill the call of God in your life. That may look like a little less staring at your phone. It may just look like a little less just sitting around. Maybe a little less conversation with people that aren't building your faith. A little less wasting money on things that aren't eternal. For some of us, a little less eating. Amen. It's a little less, maybe a little more get out the house and do something. Do something. That should be the new workout plan, the new fad that's taking the nation by storm. What's it called? Do something. Watch this. I don't know if you know this, but all diets, they they ultimately work because all of them make you watch what you're eating. Like the big big diet now is the plant-based diet. Remember a couple years ago, it was the all meat diet? Remember that? Everybody was losing weight by only eating meat. Now everybody's eating, losing weight by only eating plants. Like, why does that work? Because you're doing something. And God honors your efforts. You're doing something. Right? It was intermittent fasting for a while that everybody was losing weight on. Next it'll be, you know, drinking orange juice. I don't know. It'll be something, though. I promise you. Only eat fat. Just eat fat. Okay. (laughs) Sign me up. Lard right here, right? (laughs) Forgive me. That's... Forgive me. But when you do stuff on purpose, God honors it. Right? It's easier, it's easier to steer a moving ship. And so we just got to get moving this year. Stand with me if you would. And if I can encourage you in any way, and if I had control over your life in any way, I would encourage you to purposefully live for God in 2020. Because it would be just terrible to fulfill all of your plans and not wind up with heaven in, with Jesus in eternity in heaven. That would be a really bad decision. Amen. All right. I feel like, can we we sing a song, Corey? Actually, what what song did we start with? What song did you leave that was fast? Come up, Anastasia. Come on, let me get the band up. Corey, not you, but let me get Anastasia. Why don't you leave one of the songs we sang? Here's what I want to do. Yeah, amen. Come on. We have a drummer here still, or do you already leave? There he is. Yep, that Frank. Like, oh, that's me. He was hoping to be someone else. Here's what I want to do. Can I have my prayer team come forward? I want us to sing a song, but I want to give you an opportunity to respond and decide I'm following Jesus this year. I'm following Jesus here. I'm, I'm purposefully following Jesus. Now, if you need to go, we're going we're gonna to have our, uh, our, 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 our first impressions team in the lobby. We'd love to say hello. I'll be there in one moment. But I want to I encourage you right now, make a decision on whether or not we're going to follow Jesus this year. Let's just pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we love you this morning. Huh. We love you this morning. We decide right here and right now that you are worthy of us following you. We thank you for this opportunity, Lord. And we just respond in faith right now. We decide, yes. We say, yes, we will follow you in this year. Yes, we want your plan for our life. Yes, we want your story to unfold in our lives. Yes, we want to be followers of Jesus Christ. You say amen. Go clap off for the Lord if you would. Listen, 
if you need prayer for anything, if you just want someone to agree with you now, like I'm going to live different in 2020, that can mean that you're going to become a Christ follower or just that you're just going to be wholehearted in the burning room or you're going to, we're going to win people for Jesus here or you're going to invite your coworkers this year. You're going to be bold enough to invite them to church. You're going to invite your neighbors to church. You're going to be a witness for Jesus Christ. Don't leave here without somebody agreeing with you in faith. If you need healing in your body, our prayer team's up here. If you need anything, we're up here. We're going to be in the lobby in one moment. God bless you. Give a clap off for the Lord. Thank you so much. Hallelujah. You guys ready to worship? Yes. So, before we go into the song, I just want to, I just want to encourage you. You know, Pastor said it's a lot easy to steer a moving ship. And I can say as, as someone who, who has some boating experience, um, when the engines aren't on, you just go whichever way the current throws you. And I've gotten in some, some bad, bad situations because the engines weren't on, right? So when we leave here today and as we go into this song, just, let's just make a decision to just move with God, right? Just, I'm just going to go forward with you, Jesus, even if I don't know exactly what that looks like right now. Amen? Amen. Let's, let's sing this song together. The one who made the stars is smiling down on us with love in his eyes for all. You believe if you need prayer this morning, we have people who want to pray with you up here. You can come forward right now during this song and get prayer before we go. Amen. Don't wait, just come forward and uh you go to the ends of the earth just to take hold of me.
Father. I thank you for each and every person and family represented here. And I just bless them in the name of Jesus. I bless you to prosper. I bless you not just, not just to walk in a good story, not just to walk the good path, but to, to find the God story for your life, the God plan, what he has for you and your family in this new year. In Jesus' name. Can we give it up for Jesus one, one time this morning? God bless you guys. Thank you for joining us. Have an amazing Sunday. Happy New Year to you and your family. We'll see you guys next week. Our normal services at 9 and 11 a.m. Enjoy the, the week with your family. God bless you guys.